The mental health and physical health of Canadian soldiers has been a top story in national news recently. Although the latest stories are mainly focusing on sexual abuse in the military, today we want to discuss the long-lasting effects of military life on our veterans. Tonight we will explore the veteran experience and mental health right after we take a look at this week's hottest headlines, coming up now on Junior ECTV. Hi, I'm your host Rhiannon Trail and this is Junior ECTV, a show that gives teens a place to talk about important issues from their perspective. So tonight I want to start off by welcoming Christian, Layla, Ryan, who it's your first time on the show, yeah, really nice excited to, to have you, and Teddy. So I want to talk about this first um, piece that's been getting a lot of attention. So our Prime Minister, it seems like we always talk about our Prime Minister uh, in, during this section, but he gets a lot of media coverage. So our Prime Minister is taking a day off this week, it already happened on Wednesday, Day. It was his wedding anniversary. His wife was with him on a trip to Tokyo. He's there for G7 meeting. Um, and he decided that he wanted to take the afternoon off on the Wednesday to take his wife to a spa in Tokyo and to relax and celebrate their anniversary. People are attacking him, saying, you know, he's on the job, it's in the middle of the week, he's out there on taxpayer dollar. Why is he taking, you know, a vacation? He basically said it's a work life balance thing. Mar his marriage is important to him, and this just so happened to be a special opportunity he paid for it himself um, and so what do you guys think about this well this is kind of unique because I don't really think the Prime Minister gets regular days off like he doesn't get Saturday and Sunday because the country still runs on Saturday and Sunday yeah. and he doesn't get really that many sick days or holidays so if the dude wants to take a, like a day off to spend with his wife for their anniversary just let him. He's a human. Like, let him, and it always comes back to just let him actually be human. Like, everyone has these, like, strict policies of, no, he can't do anything. He has to be this structured, I don't know, bean pole of a person. But it's like, he can't live that way. For someone to be mentally stable enough mm -hmm. to run our country, I think he can take a day off and have a nice, relaxing spa day with his wife. Okay. A, lot of, a lot of what's... Excuse me. A lot of what has been in the headlines about him recently, I think, has been much ado about nothing. Mm. Um, like the elbow thing. Elbow like, gate. Hey, like, <laughs> come on. Like, yeah. I, the, like, yes, he's human. I get that completely. But what I really don't get is how much of a big deal he's made about this. Like, he, instead of kind of just keeping it, if it's private, I would, I mean, if I were in his position, which I'm not, I would kind of keep it private and not make a big deal about it because it sort of does lower that facade of, oh, I'm here on a country sure. business. I don't think he's making a big deal. I think the media is making a big deal. What do you think, Teddy? I think, I think you're on the right track. We need to think about why is Justin Trudeau in the headlines so much? And the fact of the matter is it's completely different party dynamics. When you have a conservative leader, and we had Stephen Harper, I mean, I think we've talked about him on the show maybe two or three times. It's because you have the concept within conservatism of your government leader is your government leader alone. That's why his wife wasn't really in the public eye. She didn't really have that large of a role as well. Mm -hmm. And you're focusing more of them as a leader instead of a person. Mm -hmm. Whereas Trudeau, like him or hate him, he's someone who's trying to humanize that position. And sure. his wife is as well. And that's why they're being put to the front line. I, I, exactly. I and that's a party thing, though. Like, Brian and Mila Mulrooney were pretty, like, high profile as well. Mm -hmm. But I see your point. Yeah. Ryan, what do you think? Yeah, so I, I think I would have a little bit of a different opinion uh, as opposed to all of you guys. I think every uh, prime ministers, for sure, they do deserve a day off. Uh, look, uh, President Obama, he regularly has uh, days off. Yeah, he goes yeah. golfing, things like that. And many would argue that he has even more responsibilities than the prime minister of Canada. But at the same time, I don't think it's really appropriate uh, to, to um, do it while on an important business mission like the G7 or something like that. Okay. I think it's okay to do that at home. Uh, when you're here in Canada, because even though he's paying for the hotel uh, himself, you have to keep in mind uh, the the taxpayer cost of of what it uh, of of idling staff there uh, yeah, in I Japan. Yeah, I heard the idling staff argument, but I gotta say, like. Aren't these people busy that they have other things? Like, while he's doing, can they not still be working? Or do they just, like, sit and look at birds tweeting when he's not in the room? That was the only interesting thing that I thought. But, yeah, I see your point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's, but, let's think of it like this, though, okay? So his wife is playing a much larger role than Stephen Harper's. And if we think about like that, the fact that they're preserving and working on this marital balance between the two, we're really getting more output. 
this is just a productive thought. You know, you have a very nice anniversary and stuff. Build on the teamwork, and that's why you know, as, as we know as well, she's asking for the assistant as well. They're trying to open up. They're trying to expand the position to include both of them, okay. and I think that's what we need to be thinking well, let's about. Let's move on to the next uh, the next piece. But I do want to say, just as a side note, um, so the prime minister's anniversary is the same anniversary as mine and my husband. <laughs> so we're really cool anniversary <laughs> buddies. Yeah. Hi, Trudeau. <laughs> Maybe I can come with you. Um, okay. Anyways. So this is a really controversial piece. So there's two Canadian comedians, young ladies, who have created a tour, a comedy tour. It's called Rape is Real Everywhere, a comedy show. And they actually are making rape jokes. That's what they do. And they are saying that they feel that they're, sex they're both sexual assault victims, and they feel like they are neutralizing the playing field by making these jokes and that because they're victims like they are the ones that should have the right to talk about these issues in whatever way they want and instead of you know boys in the locker room making rape jokes which I, apparently people think that happens I don't know um, that they're doing this how do you guys feel about this is this appropriate is this wrong is this appropriation what is this who wants to start on this one Ryan yeah I don't know I don't know how that would be funny I, like Personally, I'm sure many people or almost everybody would agree with me. I don't know how you would find rape jokes funny, and mm -hmm. I don't know if saying, if using the, the fact that you were a sexual victim, I don't know if that can really defend the fact that you're making rape jokes, because I'm sure that many people who, many other people who are rape victims uh, would be offended with, with these jokes. Mm -hmm. And I don't understand if they're trying to make light of it. I don't know if you really can make light of rape or something as serious as that, but. I, overall, I just don't think it's really appropriate. Okay, what do, what do you think, Teddy? I think we need to consider the fact that all of us didn't want to say something to begin with, and this is a culture which surrounds every issue, which you know brings a lot of emotions out of us. We see similar things happen, uh, like the Holocaust, for example. Is okay, the Holocaust goes 9/11. SNL actually did a record number of layoffs mm -hmm. immediately after it. After 9/11, because joke. of the, not because of the joke, but because of the accident itself. When when these big events happen sometimes we worry and we think, okay, we need to, to bring it down, we need to bring the debate to serious. Sometimes, though, some people think you need to shift it the other way. 9-11 jokes today are being made by an SNL cast member, for example, whose own father actually died in the tragedy. And he makes the jokes, right? He says it's a way not only for him to cope, but it's because you need to take control. And it helps him with that. Yeah. Holocaust, the exact same thing. So many Jewish comedians and such have built their careers, essentially, around the thing. making those jokes. But yeah. now when it comes to rape jokes, it's just painful, maybe it's because of our positions. And we need to consider the way they're making it. They're not necessarily making it you know, pro-rape. It could be making fun of the rapists themselves. You know what, as a young woman, it's kind of, I'm really on the fence with this one, because it's like, I don't think rape is funny, it's not a topic that generally should be laughed about, but at the same time, like, I think if it is empower the, empowering these women, and it is empowering other women and other rape victims, because women aren't the only people mm -hmm. who get raped, but if it, this is the platform of empowerment, then I think that's something really, really good, mm -hmm. and I think people should, instead of just Going straight well, and being like, no, this like is terrible. shameful. Close the door. Don't talk well, we about it. We, we can't, can't make like, it like we can't that. Be like that. Yeah, like, can't. Here's the thing. And I mean, if you watch this show, you will know why I'm not a comedian. But or nor can I try. But you like, fool me. like, like <laughs> serious. Like honestly, if and they have earned every right to talk about this. Like, let's be honest. They've been through. Yeah. I've I've never been through that before. I can only imagine what that's like. Sure. If they want to joke about it, good for them. Thank God. Like seriously, we need people. Because once you bring something to the kitchen table like mm -hmm. that, then all of a sudden we can actually do something about it. Like we, one of the biggest. And I don't mean to sound like Donald Trump here. I really don't. Mm -hmm. But we have a problem with political correctness. We really we do. We really people do. People are afraid to say anything because because one person's going to get offended. And there's this whole, I think someone coined the term cry bully culture. Yeah. Where people This is what's are, happening to Trudeau. People are victims of things and then they get really, really aggressive about it. Mm -hmm. Instead of being moderate and resolving things, they just become so entrenched that things like this don't happen. I don't know if it's applicable with this, but I think that they have I agree. If they, no, if let's funny, end on that point because go. we gotta go, but I I one hundred percent agree with you. Um, we will be right back with more Junior ECTV and our special guest right after this break.
Insurance Bureau of Canada is the national industry association representing Canada's private home, auto, and business insurers, and is a proud supporter of the Junior Economic Club and Junior ECTV. Learn more at ibc.ca. This month on Channel 100, watch a movie on the house with Rogers on Demand. I had nothing to do with the disappearance of my wife. Their only hope is a confession. You don't know anything yet? You need to tell me. You're asking me if I killed my wife? We're giving you a new identity. You're Honey Morgan, divorced housewife from Iowa. The confidence builder. Damn it! All through June, check out the Movies on the House collection on Channel 100 and start watching today. Join the movement. You have the power to give life. Donate blood today. The opinions expressed in the following program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of Rogers nor Rogers TV. Junior ECTV. I'm Rhiannon Trail, and tonight I want to welcome Carl Desrochers, Veteran Chief Warrant Officer for the Canadian Armed Forces, to our show to help us understand the veteran experience. So, Carl, thank you so much for joining us on the show. If you could, for a moment, could you tell us a little bit about your experience in the military and what, what you did and how long you served? So, I joined the Army here in Toronto, not far from here, at uh, Young and Shepherd in 1980. I was 17 years old. Um, I became an infantry soldier and I served for the next 32 years. Wow, okay. And I retired four years ago. Wow. As, so a chief warrant officer was my, uh, my eventual rank. Wow, that's amazing. What drove you to want to join in the first place at 17? It's, uh, it's an interesting story. I grew up in the inner city here in Toronto. Yeah. And uh, quite literally I saw a kid on the on the uh, streetcar going down Bathurst Street in a sea cadet uniform one of these uh, sort of old white sea yeah. cadet uniforms and I was like wow That's how so much cool. did that outfit cost and he said no I'm actually a cadet so I joined the sea cadets for about a year for that outfit yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> clearly and uh, I joined the army cadets uh, about a year later um, so I was in army cadets throughout high school and so on and wow. then I just went straight from high school into the army. What would you say to the students here? What was the highlight of your career? What's one of the best moments that you can that you could tell us about? Well, there, well, I mean, there are many. the uh, The armed forces gives you tremendous opportunities, and uh, and it's not all about fighting or flying jets or whatever. There, there are literally dozens and dozens of trades um, in the armed forces. But I would say the most exciting thing about being a member of the armed forces being able to help people so it's not like a video game and it's not uh, you know it's not all shooting and and dying and mm -hmm. whatever it's uh, it's about helping people when they're at their worst and uh, that's that's normally when armed forces used and could you tell us and I know this might be difficult but what was a low point for you in your career I'm sure you had to see some difficult things and deal with some difficult things yeah absolutely I, I think the low point and and it it's it's not just one thing it's many things you know we lost uh, 160 soldiers in Afghanistan and um, you know all of those ramp ceremonies and uh, and all of those memorial services and so on it um, it, it brings that back over and over again, and you hate to see that happen. Uh, some of them are young people that you've, you've trained or worked with or have worked for you, mm -hmm. and um, it, it's unfortunate. It's part of the business, um, but that's, really difficult. that's the no, low for point. Sure. Yeah. So I want to ask you guys your opinion, because I feel, and this may be my assumption and I could be wrong, I feel as though people of your generation are kind of 
detached now from the military, the idea of serving the country in that way, um, and just even really fully grasping what a veteran's experience may have been. How do you guys feel about that? I think kids have been getting pretty savvy now about the whole thing. I've never met a single person who's interested in going into the Army or Navy. All of them are gunning for the Air Force. They understand that that's uh, at least the most fun experience, I'd say. But something that's really interesting to me is, of them all, only one actually wants to go into Most of them want to go into the engineering aspect or this and that. And I guess it just goes to show, as you're mentioning, it's not just about the fighting and this and that. It's about getting into the trades. It's about helping people. So it's good to just see that kids are realizing that it's an employment opportunity. Okay, yeah. Ryan, you kind of shook your head like agreed with me. Yeah, I think, I think uh, obviously not the, not the four of us at this table, I think the vast majority of my, uh, our generation uh, doesn't necessarily show the, the amount of respect towards our veterans that they deserve. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know exactly what the, the cause of this is or, or what the source of that is, but I, I see it uh, th throughout the year, even around Remembrance Day, just for an example, at the Remembrance Day ceremony at my school, uh, you would see kids who would, who would see that as a, as a free period and, and would yeah, skip, just skip the ceremony. It's, it's pathetic, really, yeah. it is. It is pretty pathetic. And, and I don't know exactly uh, what comes per, from this. I, I think that a lot of people uh, in our generation are, fail to realize why we have a free country and they kind of take it for advantage. Um, and I think maybe it also ties into the fact that we're not necessarily in that, that big of a time of war right now. Mm -hmm. um, and and we, we don't necessarily see a threat in our day-to-day -day life. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I think that also plays a role in it. And, and one last thing to add uh, as to why I think uh, our generation doesn't, doesn't show our veterans the amount of respect they deserve is, is particularly th in our education system from what I've experienced. Yes. Anyways, I'm just finishing up grade 12 right now. Yeah. From elementary school all the way up to high school, I can't remember doing one assignment focused on our veterans or focused on our military mm. or even if That's we have sad. a lesson. It is. It is sad. And, and I feel like if there was one, it's because the teacher wanted it in there. It's not necessarily the it curriculum. It was a personal yeah, choice. E even this year, uh, courses that I've taken like history and, and world issues, we discuss wars. We discuss uh, things that have happened in the past involving the Canadian military, but we don't focus on where how, these veterans are these how days. How does that make you feel, Carl, hearing that statement coming from a young person that it's just not ingrained in our education system? Do, do you agree with that sentiment? or? It's... Um, it's not surprising. Uh, the military is, it's, it's not very overt. It's very low key mm -hmm. in Canada. It's not like the United States. I think that a lot of people are um, uncomfortable with how to approach people in uniform. Mm. Um, and, and that's caused by, you know, caricatures and movies and so on. Military folks are always yelling at people and, you know, there's that kind of... Get down and uh, do ten. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. There's that, that kind of... Uh, that's what I picture. And scrubbing the floor with a toothbrush. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's not a lot of that that goes on in the modern military. No so, scrubbing floor with toothbrush uh, ever? Um, not well, even once? No, there, <laughs> there is, but not... What not, were you going uh, to say? Building on that, because I think that's really important. I think one of the, if there is a problem, and I think there probably is with this recognition of our military and our veterans, but like the military as a whole, it's because by people, people my age at least, it's pretty abstract. And I think that's just the way it's presented to mm -hmm. us. Like we hear in school a lot about Vimy Ridge, um, Remembrance Day, poppies and, and videos and it's very and songs and it's very, you know, powerful. But it's about a history from a very long time ago. And some people like me find that cool. Some people can't relate to terrible sacrifices made people that long ago because they were that long ago. Mm -hmm. And we don't really talk about what happened in Afghanistan, what happened in Bo Bosnia. I mean, some people don't even know where Bosnia is. That's mm -hmm. kind of sad. Yeah. Like that kind of thing. And it's just so abstract, and I kind of find that as a problem because yes, it's important to talk about Vimy Ridge, and to us, and even to, and I find this weird. Like we barely talk about World War Two in school. It's mm -hmm. all World War One, World War Two, Korea. Like all mm -hmm. these different conflicts that our people have served in are completely unknown. It's just too abstract the way we approach it right now. That has to change. You know what? To interject here, I actually have a little bit of a different opinion because within my family and within my friend group, it's actually very apparent. Because uh, one of my closest cousins next year is joining the uh, infantry. So for us, we're kind of looking 
uh, head to the future in regards to that, and so now we're all gathering all this information to help him make this transition from civilian life into the Army. Um, so for me and for my friends, this has now become a reality to us that someone who we know who's so close to us is going into mm -hmm. the Army. And so for I think for us, that's kind of a little bit of an awakening. And so now for, we try our best to do our best in regards to respecting our veterans and in regards to having the information to uh, to approach a, a veteran properly and not in a disrespectful manner. But it's just interesting that none of you guys have that experience, but for me personally, I know someone who's going in and now I'm a little bit apprehensive because as you said, there was 160 soldiers, but I think it will be good for him, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm still nervous. Well, sure, but the other really interesting thing that I think we need to be doing is having somebody like Carl, you know, a young, relatable person yeah. who's in the flesh, Thank sitting here. That. Yeah, no, for <laughs> sure, but sitting here and actually going to schools and talking about your experience and what it actually is like, the career opportunities, mm -hmm involved you know with with joining the military and what that looks like because I think so many young people just they think this old historic vision they, they think black and white books they're thinking about things that are not current even though it's a current you know modern organization um, and I think that people miss that point so I want to ask you this and I, I'm asking all of you including you Carl there's a lot of anti-war sentiment there's a lot of you know peace and love and and you know you you look at not just peace That's and love but crap. If you feel as though you don't believe in war and you you know are an advocate of peace and, and Canadians are always trying to be positioned as the peacemakers, the peacekeepers. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people don't realize how active our military is because we just have this idea that we're just like, you know, sending in supplies after the fact or whatever else. So people always say, like, well, what do you even do if you join the Canadian military? When you think of the United States or something, you think of a really active military, and for some reason people don't think the same thing in Canada. But if you don't really believe in war, does that mean that you would be less supportive of soldiers and, and veterans and, and everything else? Something that's always irritated me is whenever you bring up soldiers and the military and stuff and then you instantly have Canadian youth and stuff jump to the US. Yes. Because there's a huge difference. It's something I want to cite right now, Chrétien, I've brought him up a lot, but when he refused to follow Bush's escapades into Iraq, that showed a clear decision that showed a clear, clear amount of, of foresight, of thought into this. And in fact, very recently, Tony Blair, who ended up going and ended up getting uh, appreciated by Bush, as he said, the UK is one of our grace allies, has recently said that the Iraq war was a mistake. A huge mistake. He himself yeah. has said it was a huge mistake. And the fact that we have a government that's so savvy, that's so intelligent in this regard, we should appreciate the fact that we are the peacekeeping force. The fact that when people go to different countries, up until recently, of course. Mm -hmm. They used to wear the Canadian patches because that would help out. And the only issue with that is anti-war sentiment plays so well. Justin Trudeau, for example, pulling out the airstrikes. Mm -hmm. That's something which I'm a left-leaning person, yet I still believe that there should be the quick, striking response to ISIS. But the issue is because of this anti-war sentiment, even in the U.S., mm -hmm. amongst the Republican Party, they're having trouble gaining the support to go because everyone cites Vietnam. A s significant mistake, but what people need to realize is with proper oversight, with proper thinking, we have to start learning to trust our government to make the right decision towards our military and start voting for rational thought instead of just hyperbole. How do you That's, feel? I, I just, sorry, just to extenuate that, I completely agree. Like, it, it's incredibly easy to have anti-war sentiments. It's really, really easy to say, mm -hmm. oh, I'm for peace, and it, the imagery sounds great. Once you get below the surface, you recognize that sometimes the easiest thing isn't always the right thing. Mm -hmm. And the mm -hmm. other thing is, is that it, in terms of supporting the soldiers, that kind of thing, if you're a peace person, like if I can alliterate, that counts as well. But the big problem is that our military, if I may say, I think is quite underfunded. And it's really, really been pushed aside by a lot of governments in the past to the point where we have these, I think they've retired them now, the replenishment oilers. They're old, they're buying parts on eBay, that actually happened. They don't work. The ships, like the submarines, we have four submarines, two of which, or three of which I think now work, one's in repairs, like it's back mm -hmm. and forth, like they're all neglected. And people think peacekeeping, oh well peacekeeping, we can just be peaceful. Well you look at Rwanda, mm -hmm. and you look what happens with peacekeepers with no teeth, can't keep the peace they end up getting killed themselves. You need like strength to keep peace. And we don't have that because people shove the military under the rug. Is I think it's quite sad. Is this resonating with you, some of this stuff, Carl? Or it's, can you uh, <laughs> give us the... 
the lowdown? It's a it, no. It's a fantastic debate, and I'm actually um, very impressed with how how knowledgeable um, you all are. So. It, it may have been a slip of the tongue, but you used the term peacemakers and peacekeepers. The idea of peacekeepers um, was founded in Canada. Mm. And we became very proud of that fact, and it was, um, it was topical for the time. We had two superpowers that controlled all their satellite states, and everybody kind of fell in line, and everybody knew where the, the uh, the fictional battle lines would be and so on, and we averted that whole Cold War crisis. Well, as soon as the war fell, or the wall fell in 1989 between East and West Germany, and everybody was looking for their peace dividend, now all the satellite states no longer were controlled by these two superpowers. We're now living in the fallout of that. And uh, the term, you know, as a 30-year, 30 32-year infantry veteran at the tip of the spear, I've done, um, I've done six operational tours overseas in, in you know, the first Gulf War, Cyprus, which was classic peacekeeping, Bosnia, Kosovo, Croatia, Afghanistan. Um, what, what becomes apparent is that the old rules no longer apply, and the term peacekeeper is oxymoronic. In order to keep peace, there has to be a peace to keep. Mm. That means the two sides have to be invested in peace. Um, the fact of the matter is, I went to Cyprus in 1989, I went to the first Gulf War in 1990, and everything I did after that was either peacemaking or peace enforcement, which is war. Right. Um, you, cannot, you cannot go into a battle space with a weapon and good intentions. Um, it just it simply doesn't work because the other side has a say. I think that's so powerful to hear you say that though because I think that the average Canadian isn't so well informed and has this idea that's not exactly correct. So I, th I like that we debunk that here. Can we talk a little bit about the support that we give our veterans? Um, you know, once they're once they're trying to transition back into civilian life, we've we've heard it much more openly spoken about the mental health and uh, post-traumatic stress, drug and alcohol abuse, these kinds of mm -hmm. things that happen after people have had an experience and 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 aren't getting some of the support that they need. Can you speak to the mental health experience of a veteran and, and how, what do you feel is missing in the equation? So um, it goes back to, to one of your earlier points about uh, we don't see our military a lot. Our military are garrisoned in a lot of sort of remote locations in Canada. We see our reserve forces a lot more than we see our regular forces. Uh, reserve forces are garrisoned in the cities and so on, and they have largely a domestic uh, domestic role. However, every operation that we've done in the last 20 years has been 30% reservists. Some of those reserve units are also in remote locations. So they become a cohesive battle group or a co cohesive operational unit that gets deployed, and then when they redeploy back to Canada, they're kind of scattered to the winds, and. And some of the soldiers, some of the, the, the personnel, I speak about soldiers because I was a soldier, sure. but some of the armed personnel fall through the cracks. Um, the Canadian Forces has great programs in place to take care of its veterans. Uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs does, does a fantastic job with the resources that they have. But uh, it, it goes back to, to, uh, to your point. Um, armed force is what's called one of the instruments of national power and influence. So it could be diplomacy, it could be, um, it could be economics, it could be foreign aid, or it could be armed force. Uh, the armed forces don't commit themselves to operations. Our leadership commits the armed forces to, uh, to operations. And when you make that commitment, from the perspective of armed forces personnel, it's a sacred commitment. If you send an 18-year-old into an operation and that 18-year-old returns somehow broken, mm -hmm. you, you have made a commitment, regardless of which party's in power, the military's apolitical, mm -hmm. you've made a commitment to that person for the rest of their life. And from our perspective, you should honor that sacred commitment. Absolutely. Because we go into it with unlimited liability. We mm -hmm. understand Absolutely. that we could get killed. Uh, so one question I have really quick, because we don't have a lot of time left uh, before break, in the, the mental health aspect of, of 
this conversation, would that deter you from wanting to join the military because you see what some of the soldiers are facing when they're coming home? You know, it certainly deters me from wanting my cousin to join the military because I really care for him and I just don't want to see him come home and see, like, he's obviously going to change because every experience in life changes you, but I don't want him, I don't want to see him broken. I love this person so much and so dearly and to think that he's going to go somewhere where he purposely did that and he, well, with intention and with good intentions but he came back hurt, mm. It re that really freaks me out. That's actually the thing I'm the most worried about because I heard there's more soldiers who commit suicide back home than actually get killed in combat. And how am I supposed to send my cousin off somewhere with my blessing and my goodwill is when I know something bad could happen and it's not something over there that could happen but something back home that could happen. Anyone else have any? Personally, I don't, I don't think I could, I could deal with uh, going to war or... or or peacekeeping, peacemaking, things like that. I don't think I could deal with that myself. And I think that's why I respect uh, our, our armed forces so much because they, they, they're it's willing to be sacrifice. able, yeah, 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 they're willing to be able to do that. They're willing to go there uh, and they're willing to deal with the repercussions following whatever they see or whatever well, they have to a, deal I with. Well, I think there's a desire to serve the country and there's a pride that comes in that and you do make sacrifices and sometimes you're sacrificing your own life, right? So it's no really interesting. We are going to take a short break and we'll be back with more on the veteran experience with Carl Desrochers uh, right after this. Insurance Bureau of Canada is the National Industry Association representing Canada's private home, auto and business insurers and is a proud supporter of the Junior Economic Club and Junior ECTV. Learn more at ibc.ca. America, part of the Rogers Super Sports Pack. Catch all the group matches included with your subscription from June 3rd to 14th. Order through your remote or call 1-888-ROGERS-1 today. Opinions expressed in the following program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of Rogers nor Rogers TV. Trail and you are watching Junior ECTV. We've been talking about the veteran experience and mental health with Carl Desrochers, a veteran chief warrant officer for the Canadian Armed Forces. And so now, Carl, we do our lightning round. Mm -hmm. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the students a series of questions. They'll write their answers on the board and then we'll chat about them. So here's the first question for you guys. What percentage of those with PTSD, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, attempt suicide? What do you think? What percentage of people that are suffering from that condition? Um, and we'll start with you, Teddy. And obviously we know that anybody could suffer from PTSD, but it is a common, um, a common thing expressed or experienced by our veterans. I put down about 30% because I'm just okay. considering all that. And ba based on knowing the actual suicide statistics, I just okay. wonder if that's around it. Okay, how about you, Ryan? I put down 50%. And I think I think just based on everything that we see in the news recently, and uh, and and 
the fact that uh, a lot of the people uh, don't try to reach out for help far too often. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think th that 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 contributes to, to such a high level that that many people in, in Canadian society aren't aware of, and that's why I put fifty percent okay. because I think it's higher than any uh, that the normal person okay. would assume. Layla, you know I'm going twenty five percent because I really hope it's not even this much because we can't have these people going through this and that just it's awful to think that these people are trying to and i really i really just please god be good to me like please not be higher than this because that'd make me really sad okay christian uh, i hope i'm wrong i legitimately hope i'm wrong i feel like it's around 40 that's a guess okay. I just, okay. Oh yeah, yeah. So the actual answer is that 19% okay. attempt Feel suicide, but 49% contemplate suicide. Okay. Um, okay. Carl, could you wow. speak to that just really quickly? Um, you know, do, does that sound about right to you with your experience and knowing a lot of people that are suffering? Yeah, it's uh, the statistic obviously is right. It's much higher than the national average. Um, a lot of that has to do with uh, with isolation and things like survivor guilt. So, um, you know, if, if armed forces members go on operations and they lose uh, they lose members of their unit, their team, or whatever, and 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 it's not exclusive to um, combat operations. If sometimes, although they're very rare, there's training accidents and things like that. Um, you, you know, people have a hard time dealing with things like survivor guilt. Mm. I will say that uh, that there are a number of programs available to, to soldiers, and one of the most effective things that we find is um, is peer counselors. So you know, the stigma that goes along with uh, with post traumatic stress disorder and and uh, members of the forces feeling like that's some sort of a weakness, um, that's that's being eroded now by the programs that are in place. And, uh, and we found, at least while I was still in uniform, that one of the most effective tools is peer counseling. Okay, you know. that's really interesting. Let's go to the next question. What do you think is the best quality a soldier gains from joining the Canadian Armed Forces? So what's the best quality that somebody would gain? Um, and we'll start with you, Christian. Um, what do you think it is? Or Christian likes time to yeah, think. Yeah, please. We'll start with Ryan. Because Teddy's also yep. thinking. Okay, Ryan, what are you? What do you think? So I put down determination. Okay. Because just as as you were saying earlier, um, normally when Canadian soldiers, um, e even if it's their last breath, they, they're not uh, they're not going to turn down uh, their position for for any any other position in the world because they're there to serve their country and that that's what they want to do for their life. Okay, Layla, I'm going to look at you next. Um, I think this is really bad grammar, but knowing yourself, I think you'd probably get to learn a lot about yourself and really know who you are through your years of service and training. And I think the training is so intense, it pushes you to like look inside yourself and be like, yes, this is who I am, I can do it. So, And okay. I think being in touch yourself is a really good thing. Sure. Christian? I, I mean, I, I hope this is true compassion. Like Layla and I were talking over the break about Les Mis, the last line, to love another person is to touch the face of God. Like, I, I just think that when you're in such a horrific situation, which, which soldiers find themselves in sometimes, like being able to stay human, to stick with your teammates, to help people, and to empathize with knowing that the people on the other side and the civilians are humans too, like I can only imagine the kind of emotion that brings up. Mm -hmm. and Absolutely. And Teddy, yeah, what was did you say? Of essentially empathy because there's a certain worldliness to it and it's something that you wouldn't expect, especially considering our stigma towards them. But in reality, I'd say most of the pro-war hungry, they're the enemies, we're the good guys, screw them, we rock, are from the people outside the military. Because when you're actually in it, there's no one there that's pulling the trigger and being glad that they, they did this. Mm -hmm. they, every death to them, I feel like, is, is a life-changing experience. Yet because of that, they have to understand that they're doing this for others. They're doing it to protect others. They're mm -hmm. doing it to help others. And as a result, you have that, that, that you think about it, but more importantly, you understand that I'm, I'm being the martyr, essentially, mm -hmm. in that sense. I'm sacrificing. I think that's really well said. Exactly. And what would you say is, you know, the best quality a soldier would gain? It's, uh, th I mean, those thoughts are tremendously well, well said. Um, I think oh, there's so many. Teamwork, teamwork is the big thing, and it's kind of a thematic of, of some of the responses that you put down. Um, the military, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't strip away. It, it kind of removes your... Uh, your sense of self-importance and gives you a sense that you're part of a team 
and uh, when you when you take away that 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 uh, that arrogance and you realize that there's something bigger than than yourself then you can become compassionate and empathetic and and um, all of the themes that, that you've re reflected yeah, no, here. Those are great answers, you guys. Um, so here's an interesting one. Um, according to um, veteransofcanada.com, how many Canadian military veterans are there, approximately? Alive? Yeah. Yes. And I'm going to start with Teddy. So guess a number that you think. Okie dokes. Uh, I'm going to say about. 200,000 right now. Okay. 200,000. Okay. How about you, Ryan? I put down uh, approximately 300,000, not necessarily um, that have, have served in combat, but, but have served with the armed forces. Okay. Layla? I'm going to take the middle ground and say 250,000. Okay. Okay. And Christian, I what think do going you? Back at, uh, right around where Teddy thinks, two hundred thousand probably. Okay. I, I guess. So the actual answer, approximately seven hundred thousand. Wow. That's so unexpected. I think that that's a powerful, a powerful number to help us understand, you know, how big our military really is, because I think that sometimes we don't think that it's that big. Well, yeah. So there's a difference between the number of veterans yes. and the number of people in uniform. Yes. The number of people in uniform in the Canadian Armed Forces, all total reserves and regular force, are, is a hundred thousand. A hundred thousand. So okay. we are we are barely what the United States calls an army group. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Um, it's it's very very small, and the fact that there are seven hundred thousand veterans, you have to take um, annual attrition out of that. So if someone's done a three-year, four-year contract in the military, they're okay. They're uh, they're so veteran, it, all, it is very small, actually. Very small okay. armed forces. Okay, so that is a true thing. Mm -hmm. um, okay, let's do one more really quick question. Um, what percentage of soldiers are affected by alcoholism or mental health-related issues? And Teddy, we'll go. We have to go pretty quick. Okay, I, I put down 100% because mental health issues, it doesn't need to be specific disorder stuff. I think all of them may be plagued with problems that should be helped. Okay. Ryan. I said uh, approximately 30 percent. Okay. Um, yep. Just because okay. in terms of Layla? how they feel when they come back. Ah, uh, solid 25 percent. Okay. Guessing 60. And you're just guessing guess. 60. So the answer is 17 percent. Oh, wow. But I, but I think one of the interesting things that we would have to consider is how many people are always being vocal about mental health issues. So we know that that stigma is starting to break down and we've talked about that, but I think there's still a lot of people suffering in silence. What would you say? Um, I would say, yeah, uh, there, there probably are a significant number. As I said earlier, and I said during one of the breaks, there are more avenues open to, um, to veterans now. If you think about it, and uh, I know folks think about this in the abstract, after World War II, there, there was uh, probably a much greater number of uh, soldiers that suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder. At that time, it wasn't it wasn't a thing. It was the you know it was called shell it. shock yeah. and, and these types of things. And uh, we established the Royal Canadian Legion, and uh, we basically kept these folks drunk for 70 years. Yeah. Um, you know now the Royal Canadian Legion helps the Canadian Forces and Veterans Affairs because they've lived through it. Uh, so we now have m many more avenues uh, that, Which that is folks so can reach out to. Which is so positive, and I think that's great. Yeah. Carl, I just want to thank you for coming on our program tonight and sharing your experience with us. It was so cool. And I think you should be in every school going across the province talking about your experience, because I think it's really beneficial. Um, coming up after the break, our panelists will answer some questions from our parent viewers. Stay with us. We'll be right back with more Junior ECTV. Insurance Bureau of Canada is the national industry association representing Canada's private home, auto, and business insurers and is a proud supporter of the Junior Economic Club and Junior ECTV. Learn more at ibc.ca. Bladder cancer. It's the fifth most common cancer in Canada. 
The most common symptom of bladder cancer is blood in the urine. Please, don't ignore this warning sign. If you see red, see your doctor. For information and support, visit cred.ca. What's live? We are a little spots. Tune in each week as I talk to local, national, and international leaders about life, real estate, business, and beyond. Mondays at 8.30 p.m. on Rogers TV. The opinions expressed in the following program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of Rogers nor Rogers TV. the veteran experience with our teens and now I actually want to turn it over to our parent letter segment you guys love this now Ryan let me explain to you what happens so parents ask us questions we know that you're not dr. Phil but they want a teens advice on some of these dilemmas that they're dealing with with their own teens so let's go to the first question this is coming from Annette she says my son wants to join the military and I'm really against this idea as a parent my main priority is his health and safety but he just won't listen um, he is threatening to enlist as soon as he turns 18 in a couple of months. What should I do? And so this is kind of interesting, Layla, because you're having a similar experience with your mm -hmm. cousin. So, so what do you guys think? What should Annette do? Um, I don't know. Maybe open her horizons a little bit, because I think to shut him down right away is, uh, is unfair to him. Uh, just like any other university or post-secondary experience, whether it's the trades or university or going straight into the workforce, uh, look at what it actually entails. And um, as our lovely guest said, it's not always just shooting guns and he's probably won't die. Only 160 of our soldiers actually died in Afghanistan and we have like 100,000 people. So the ratio is relatively small. Like there is a chance that it happens, but it's that that whole he will die thing is not necessarily the biggest thing that's going to come out of it. Plus, look at what he's going to gain from that. From any other work, I think he'll gain more from that than any other job or post-secondary he would go into yeah. um, in regards to his courage and who he is as a person and being that team player and just really being a, becoming a really compassionate human being and I think it will allow him to grow so I think she just needs to maybe cool it for a little bit of a minute put your mama jeans on hold and just think about it a little bit more okay I can understand when I, when, I, when I hear about a situation like that part of my mind kind of goes off about this could be sowing the seeds of a really bad parent-child relationship okay because and just and I don't know the situation I'll stress that right now but when I hear about something like that the child is threatening threatening to enlist not not saying threatening on his birthday as soon as he can get out of there and it's butting heads and that kind of thing I just sense like there could be in the future more underlying issues I would say instead of going go, pardon the pun but going to guns about it try and like you talk, always have these little lines trying, trying to like trying to like like kind of smooth it out by talking yeah as opposed to just threatening because in the end once he's 18 he's gone you talk in like news sound bite like <laughs> headlines <laughs> That's so amazing. Um, yeah. you need to consider it's gonna be really hard for it's a it's a big transition to go from home life to all of a sudden 18 fresh onto the military but I can tell you it's probably going to be a heck of a lot harder without a support system yes. at home, without a mother who's there for him, who supports him. Yes. You need to consider it from the other aspect. You say threatening to go. Some people, this could really be not his dream, but something that he feels like he has to do. Almost yeah, it's like a, a calling. Prof yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's yeah. a calling. I feel like people feel called to serve, whether it's politically or this way. Like, there's sometimes people feel called to serve their country in Absolutely. some way. Ryan? Yeah, I, I understand maybe where she's coming th from that she might feel that her son's going to be in danger if, if, if he decides to serve with the armed forces. But at the same time, if, if he wants to serve his country, I think he should respect that choice, mm -hmm. especially if he's of age to be able to make that choice. And as we've been discussing... Well, he's an adult, yeah. Yeah, yeah and, and as we've been discussing, um, 
it's not always combat roles. A lot of the times it's, it's peace, peacekeeping roles and, and showing uh, courage, not, not because you're going to go kill somebody, but because you're going to, to help some people out and, yes. and, and you're going to help out people who, who really need someone to be for there sure. for them. So, so I don't think it's all negative. I understand that she may be hesitant because she might feel like, oh, we might get injured, might get killed even in the military, but you have to look at the positives and I think they greatly no, I th outweigh I, the negatives. I think that's very good advice. Let's go to the next letter then. This comes from Jessie. She says, my daughter attends high school outside of our neighborhood and a lot of the kids that she goes to school with are a little more well off than our family is. Prom is coming up and she's expressed to me that all of her friends are spending tons of money on their dresses, nails, shoes, hair. I want her to have the same experience as her friends, but I can't afford it. What is the best solution? Get her a nice dress, get her makeup done as nice as she can, and beyond that, honestly, it's just fluff that you're really not going to remember. I mean, yeah. if you want to really hook her up, give her a ride home from the after party with all of her friends, and they will think she is hella cool. You know what? I have to say something about this, because I'm going to my prom in a month, and I was promzilla, I won't even lie, I went prom to- Promzilla? I was, I went to 19 different dress stores to find my prom dress. But one thing Whoa. that she can do is the dress stores I went to was like consigner designer and like a lot of secondhand shops, because those places have really good dresses for really, yes. really cheap. Also, you can go to really designer dresses, but look for the sale rack. These places have sale racks where they'll cut $500 dresses into like 100 bucks. And that is probably more affordable to you. Also, if you want to be like super cool mama, watch a couple YouTube tutorials on makeup, and then maybe you can help her do her makeup, you idea. can help her do her hair, be really involved in that way. That's cool. You know, so it, there's Boys, always cost saving. Do you have anything to say? First off, can I just say I love the joke that Teddy kind of slipped in there about not remembering prom. But, <laughs> I caught like, that, but I wasn't going to highlight it. <laughs> yeah. it's, um, yeah. it's, it like, honestly, it's, it's one of those things where it is what well, you make it. And I think that probably the most important thing, and I mean, I've never gone to a prom that's next year for me, but um, having that experience of knowing, you know what, I did what I could and I made this the night, it, this is gonna sound a bit circular. I made it the night I wanted it to be for me, not because of pressure, not because that I wanted to look like, or as good, good is a very relative term. Yeah, yeah. Expensive and good, as expensive as my friends, or as good as my friends. Expensive. It doesn't have to. Just yeah. be yourself, would be the best self you can be, and you'll that's be happy with advice. your life. Such a balanced approach. Yes, Ryan? It, yeah, I just think you just make it the best that you can. Um, if, if finances are an issue, just buy what you can. Don't, mm -hmm. don't get more than you need to be. It's only one night, uh, and prom itself is only a few hours. It's so true. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to throw one more thing in. Um, I'm just going to say that you can actually find like really nice dresses like Sherry Hill for cheap. I bought a Sherry Hill dress on sale for $95, and normally they go for $500. So if you do look in those like... Um, on sale things, you actually can find super nice dresses okay. for super cheap. So She's if you're listening, that sale go, rack, lady. go to the go sale rack, you will find rack. an amazing dress. I'm going to the sale <laughs> rack. That's okay, cool last thing. letter, because we only have three minutes. My 15-year-old son sale. just recently told me that he is gay. He's expressed interest in venturing to downtown Toronto to participate in the gay community, experience the nightlife, and meet new people. I fully support my son, and I want him to be able to feel like he can be part of that community, but I'm concerned about him being so young and going to these clubs alone. What do I do? He's you know, like, like, we need to realize the stigma is gone, but I'm just gonna say it straight up over here. I'm a straight teen, and I would love to experience the nightlife in red light district Amsterdam. <laughs> but my parents oh, no. sure as hell wouldn't have let me go at 15, and they probably wouldn't let me go right now at 17. Tell them, you know what you can get involved in? The, we have two the GSA, LGBT the GSA, GSA presents right over here. The GSA. Go tell them, go tell them. So you know, tell yeah. us what the GSA is for our viewers that don't All know. All right, cool. Is. Really super quick. I've been the GSA president, and what that is is the Gay Straight Alliance at my high school, and it's a community where straight people who are allies and gay kids and everything else in the LGBT community can come together and kind of share their experience, and you can get a great community in that. Um, in and of the fact that he's 15, you can't legally get into a club yeah, he at 15 be going yeah. club. So he yeah. shouldn't be. But one more thing, if he does want to get involved in the community, at the end of June, I think it's like June 30th or July 1st, I don't know, somewhere Pride around weekend. there. Go to Pride. It's a four-day long event. Long yeah. My parents are with me. It's yeah. so great. Go. It is a can great I, event. Can I also just, because I'm like, can I just say, GSA is a bit of a misleading term because it's not always about sexuality. I'm also like a heterosexual incoming GSA president. It's not all about sexuality. Okay. It's not all one sexual group, okay. but it's a cool thing. So it's a great now, that, now okay. that the plug is done as well, nightlife at 15, eh. Yeah, no, 
like, <laughs> I'm gonna side with you guys on really this quickly, one. What's your opinion? I don't know why being gay means that you have to go to a club or anything, but by all means, go to the Pride Parade and enjoy that. But you don't yeah. need to go to a club or anything like that. You're 15, <laughs> you gotta relax in the club. Also, I just remember, and this is nothing to do with a gay club or anything, but I remember when I was 15, we had a friend, like a neighbor, who got a fake ID, and it was of a 45-year-old man. <laughs> I was like, that's not going to work at all. And then another time when I wanted a fake ID, fine, I had a fake ID. It didn't really work very well, but I was trying my grandma, I lost it, and I was telling my grandma, can you help me find it? I can't find my fake ID. And my grandma's like, here, use this. It was her senior citizen's card. Like, grandma, I can't use that. That's not gonna work for me, okay? Thanks a lot. Or she tried and pawn seniors' bus tickets on me, but that's a different thing. But the Gay Straight Alliance thing is really cool, and actually it's interesting that you are an incoming president of this. Yeah. Because, yeah, I think that that shows you, because I know that you just lean a little more conservative, and I think that that doesn't have to do with it doesn't political have to leanings do, or right. religion or anything. Like, honestly, people talk, and it's good. Yeah, it's just and a space for people to come together and talk. So that seems like a much more age-appropriate place. So that's great advice, you guys. Thank you for that. I will be right back after the break with some of my final thoughts on today's topic. Stay with us. Every child dreams about the future. They dream big. They dream bold. But for millions of kids, their dreams are under siege. There are over 60 million displaced people in the world. More than half are children. Together, we have the power to help. World Refugee Day is June 20th. You can help them dream again. Donate now at worldrefugeeday.com. साउथ एशियन टुडे इस हफ्ते आप देखेंगे बहुत सारी इंपॉर्टेंट डिस्कशंस घरों की प्राइसेस जीटीए में बढ़ रही है इसका इंपैक्ट क्या होगा क्या ये आम आदमी के लिए एक अच्छी बात है या बुरी साउथ एशियन टुडे देख के आपको जरूर पता चलेगा एंड वील ऑल्सो बी टॉकिंग अबाउट टेररिज्म इन इंडोनेशिया इसका क्या होगा ये भी आप जरूर देख लीजिए साउथ एशियन टुडे The opinions expressed in the following program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of Rogers nor Rogers TV. I'm really proud about doing this show tonight and the perfect example was the parent letter that came from Annette and she was talking about not wanting her son to join the military and I think the perfect answer for Annette is watch this show tonight. Watch this show and find out what the military is really about because it's not just what you think and it can be a great experience for young people. So I want to thank our special guest Carl De Roche for really you know debunking some of those myths. I want to thank Teddy, Christian, Layla and Ryan. Uh, if you want to know anything about our show check out our website. Thank Thank you so much for joining us and I hope you catch us next time on Junior ECTV. Bye for now.